Now we would like to present to you, He is Risen Indeed. Old Mrs. Horn had very little to be happy about in life, and she let the world know it. But old Mrs. Pepper had a very different outlook. Though she too seemed to have very little to be happy about, her message to the world was alive. Already? No, you're supposed to say he is risen indeed. My mother taught it to me, and I used to greet my daughter the same way every Easter. Don't start on that story again. I know it by heart. Just because your mother woke you up shouting, he is risen, is no reason to torment me. So why don't you just go? On this beautiful Easter morning, Mrs. Pepper wished she could make her roommate experience the truth of Easter that Jesus is alive, but she had no power to influence others, or so she thought. Mrs. Horn, why don't you come on to church with me? I ain't going to no church. Easter or no Easter, what difference does it make one day from another? Every day is as hard as it can be on old folks like us. Easter's different, just look out and see. The grass is greening up and the air's as soft as a baby's breathing and the little white clouds in the blue sky couldn't belong to any other day. Easter's the resurrection, and everything comes alive to tell about it. It don't tell me nothing. If there's a God anywhere, I guess he's forgotten all about any resurrections for old bodies like us. I can't see as Easter helps much. We go on living in this old folks home, this retirement home, uh, this pre-mortuary, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> It's just the same, and we're going to have corned beef, even if just the same as if it weren't Easter, and wear the same old clothes. What, does it, what good does it do to us to have grass green and sky blue? Might as well be the other way around for all I care. You do make it sound sort of plain. It's not plain, though. It's a world full of love and life and beautiful things. And I'm glad I'm in it, even if I am only an old woman and no good to anyone. What makes you so plain, painfully cheerful? It irks me to no end. <laughs> Haven't you ever had a hardship? Why, bless you, Mrs. Horn. I've had my share of sorrow. But look outside. It's Easter. And Easter reminds me that my heartaches will end, happily end for all eternity. I declare, I don't believe you've ever grown up, Miss Pepper. If you don't hurry, you'll miss that bus, and that'll be all the adventure you have. I'm sorry you won't come, Mrs. Horn. It's a nice bus ride to Fenton. You won't be lonely, will you? I always like a long, quiet morning like this to go back and remember all the blessings I've had. I never knew how many there were till I really sit down to think about them. Having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. Mrs. Mullen gave these to me. 
Someone sent her a big box full, and she gave me seven. I'm going to carry them to church, and then I'll bring them back to look at all week long. I'll leave one now to keep you company while I'm gone. <clears throat> Goodbye. I'm real fond of you, Mrs. Horn. I sort of hate to leave you. Goodbye. You get yourself, you'll get left yourself if you don't just go. And if you get invited out to some fancy dinner by some long lost relation, you accept. Why, Mrs. Horn, how you carry on. I declare. Mrs. Pepper laughed at the joke and glided out of the building. When she had gone, Mrs. Horn grudgingly touched the spot that Mrs. Pepper had kissed and gazed at the bright spring blossom. It reminded her of a row of yellow flowers that once grew when she was a little girl in the country. Mm -hmm. There used to be a whole row of tulips alongside that gray barber. Mrs. Pepper barely caught her bus. She paid her fare out of a purse that held just four quarters and a dime and settled down into her corner. I'd like to be up on one of those scudding white clouds today. Or I'd like to ride in a big, fast automobile like that one going past. But it's a good deal to be thankful for that I've strength to ride in the bus and four quarters to pay the fare to Fenton and back. If I may believe this bus is an automobile, I can feel just as green as the woman in that one that passed us. The Lord's got plenty of smart people to do his work. He don't need me, I suppose. But it's something just to be in such a beautiful world and know there is a resurrection. This is the day that the Lord hath made, and I am going to rejoice in it. One woman, who to catch the bus had lost her breath, now used it with increasing volume as she recovered it to let the world know her opinion of the bus driver. I only wish I had my own automobile. I never saw a bus driver who wouldn't hold the bus for a lady passenger. Did you see him try to pull off while I was running? There's just no excuse for that kind of impertinence in a driver, I declare. As the bus ran through the open country, Mrs. Pepper smiled at the driver each time she caught his eye. He relaxed the scowl on his face, set there by persons who had not put on their Easter hearts with their Easter hats. Please, let me get off here. Thank you, sir, and thank you for your good driving today. You're welcome, ma'am. Glad someone appreciates it. <laughs> As she stepped down, she picked a tulip from her bunch and put it into the driver's fingers. I know you have a lot to stand, but it is Easter all the same in spite of folks' tongues. I always say, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. If you love the Lord, you can't stay angry, especially on Easter. Thank you, ma'am. It's a long time since anyone's given me a flower and a Bible verse to go with it. The bus driver closed the door and with a tug of new life at his heart, watched Mrs. Pepper's retreating little figure. She got me just in time, he thought. Another minute, and I'd have let fly at that woman, and then it would have been all up with me. One more complaint at the office, and out I go. Mrs. Pepper trotted down to the big church that she had come so far to attend. She was little and inconspicuous among the crowd in the vestibule, but she stood smiling with childlike content in her eyes until someone smiled back and led her to a seat well up toward the front in a pew next to an elegantly dressed woman. Mrs. Pepper smiled as she sat down and recognized her as the woman in the big automobile that had passed the bus. She felt as if she had met an old friend. Mrs. Ashton did not return the greeting, but Mrs. Pepper, not realizing in the least that she had been snubbed, settled herself happily to enjoy the service. The preacher read three verses of scripture and the choir sang three songs, leading all the way from praise at the triumphal entry through the sacrificial love Jesus showed on the cross and finally coming full circle to the joy of the resurrection. On the next day, much people that were come to the feast when they had heard Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna! Blessed is the King of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord.
took Jesus and led him away. And he, bearing his cross, went forth to a place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two other with him, on either side one, and Jesus in the midst.
Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulchre, bringing spices which they had prepared, and certain others with them. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulchre, and they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. finished, but Mrs. Pepper felt something was missing as the pastor spoke. The platform was dressed with flowers, the soft breeze came in through the open windows, the choir sounded jubilant, but the pastor's voice was toneless as he read and prayed. Since Friday, he had been anxious to share a message of the resurrection with his congregation and remind them that our lives should be turned upside down by the resurrection too. In fact, he had been looking forward to taking a special Easter offering. He planned to ask his people to turn their pocketbooks upside down to give a generous gift for the needy children of the Bible Mission Orphanage downtown. But when he looked out over his congregation, he saw nothing but a sea of worldly, unsympathetic faces. The sight overwhelmed him with discouragement. As he gave the announcements, he left out entirely the plea for the orphanage. But then... As he began the sermon, he looked down into Mrs. Pepper's blue eyes, which were smiling faith and confidence and childlike joy. Straightway into the minister's heart, confidence and faith and joy leaped again. 
He knew that at least one was prepared for his message. Mrs. Pepper waited breathlessly while the congregation rustled around her. Paul writes to the Philippians this prayer, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. Here Paul reminds us of a wonderful truth. It is possible for a child of God to live, and that not just on Easter Sunday, but on every day of the year, to live in the power of the resurrection. Look around at the trees in blossom, and the flowers in bloom, and the, green, and the grass turning green today, and realize that it is God's picture of what new life looks like. When you accept the risen, uh, risen Christ as your Savior, you have a new life in you. A born-again child of God should live a life brimming with joy and hope and testimony to the grace of God. Our lives should be as radiant as the world around us on a day like this. This is a day when all nature testifies to God's power in the beauty of springtime. Friend, this morning, do others around you see the power of the resurrection shining from your soul? If not, then my message this morning is for you. The preacher went on in this vein for the better part of an hour, constantly buoyed forward by willing smiles and understanding nods from Mrs. Pepper. As the minister ended his sermon, he paused. You know, I think it would be wonderful if we showed just how much joy is shining from our hearts today by taking up an Easter offering. I hope we can present a special gift to the needy children of the Bible Missionary Orphanage downtown. The congregation pondered doubtfully. It was a little irregular, but Mrs. Pepper had no doubt. She opened her purse to put her dime into the contribution plate. Mrs. Ashton, looking into the purse, saw the two quarters and the one dime. She saw the fingers fumble for the dime and then close resolutely around a quarter. They need all I can give. 35 cents won't take, will take me almost to the home. I'll walk the last few blocks. She took out the quarter and closed her purse. Mrs. Ashton understood. With a slight flush, she reopened her own mesh bag, thrust back the $5 bill that she had taken out, and groped down to the bottom for the bill that had 100 printed on its corners. It fell into the plate on top of Mrs. Pepper's quarter. Oh, how wonderful. Just to think of being able to do that. My quarter won't give one child a meal or a new outfit, but that bill will supply quite a few. Oh, it does make me wish I could do something that really counted. But if I can't, I'm glad I can see it done. Mrs. Ashton's bill preached its way down the aisle until it was covered by fluttering notes of all denominations. The plates were put back into the minister's hands, and his eyes were misty as he spoke the few words of prayer. There was no doubt now about the orphanage getting a special blessing this Easter season. Mrs. Pepper was waiting for the preacher as he came down from the platform. I can't go away without thanking you for that beautiful sermon. Those seeds you planted from God's word today will not return to him void. And thank you for the sermon you preached. Do you suppose you could spare me one of your tulips? I'd like to wear it today. Mrs. Pepper flushed with pleasure, picked out the best and gave it to him before he was swept away by the crowd of his own parishioners. She went puzzling over his words, unaware of the effect of her beaming face. How funny. He said the sermon I preached. <laughs> How he must get mixed up. Oh, with this crowd, I hope I don't miss the bus. As she reached the door, the bus was just passing out of sight. The next one would not come for 40 minutes. Mrs. Pepper settled herself to wait patiently while the crowd slowly dispersed. On the other side of the vestibule, Mrs. Ashton was waiting for her car. Mrs. Pepper smiled at her. This time, Mrs. Ashton smiled faintly in return. Are you expecting someone? I've missed my bus, but it's only 40 minutes before another comes. 40 minutes? That's an age. If you'll come with me, we'll probably overtake your bus. I don't know why Edward is so late with the car. I rarely ride in an automobile these days. It's really good of you. Now I'll get home in time for dinner. Mrs. Horn and me this morning were saying we got a little tired of corned beef for Sunday all the year, even on Easter. But just now when I miss my bus, corned beef seemed as if it would taste pretty good after all. At the home, if we aren't there by one, we miss our dinner. For 20 minutes, Mrs. Pepper chattered on while they waited for the car, and Mrs. Ashton listened with an amused interest. She learned that her guest was... Mrs. Pepper. Whose roommate was... Mrs. Horn. She heard... 
what fun it would be to walk into people's houses and see how they looked so that we could pretend the home was furnished just like that. She learned that. If you could pretend corned beef is roast duck, it really tastes like it. <laughs> and that. If I were not a person, I should like to be a tree because its roots are so deep and its head is in the heavens. Then, just when Mrs. Ashton awoke to the fact that her car was long overdue, it slid round the corner and drew up before the church. Mrs. Pepper, lingering politely behind, did not hear the cutting words of reproof that fell from Mrs. Ashton's lips. I don't know what I pay you for. If this is the service you give me on Easter Sunday, don't explain. Just drive. Yes, ma'am. The chauffeur flushed hotly, but Mrs. Ashton gave him no chance to explain his delay. I'm afraid we can't overtake your bus now, but I'll take you home, Mrs. Pepper. Oh, don't. It'll be out of your way, and I'm not a mite hungry. I don't need any dinner on a day when I can ride in an automobile. Oh, it's such a wonderful Easter. Looking at the little woman who had such great capacity for enjoyment, Mrs. Ashton pondered the difference in their circumstances and their gratitude. A softer feeling stirred in her suddenly. I'll tell you what we'll do. I'll take you home with me for dinner. I actually am going to have roast duck. I'll telephone the home and send you back this afternoon. I declare, it's a real adventure. I shall want you at four, Edwards, to take Miss Pepper home. Anything you say, ma'am. <laughs> Edwards was still smarting under Mrs. Ashton's sharp, unjust words. He had used his best speed to fix a flat tire and had made the delay as short as possible, yet he had received only blame. Mrs. Pepper followed Mrs. Ashton into the house where she discovered beauty and luxury that were beyond her fondest dreams. She took it all in with bright, eager eyes. Henceforth, she would have no difficulty in furnishing the home with imaginary wonders. The soup and the roast duck and the salad were delicious. Mrs. Pepper laughed softly, and the maid, who was passing her the fruit, looked at her in wonder. Things do taste a little better real than when you pretend them. I'll have so many new stories now to tell that I won't need to use the old ones. Some of the old ones, though, I never get tired of, like my mother. I ought to pretend I'm back with her, or I imagine the glorious days I'll be with her again in Beulah Land. That's what she called heaven, you know. We were very fond of each other. It's a comfort remembering you've made people happy, isn't it? I go over and over those days, and I'm sorry for all I didn't do for my mother and glad for all I did. You always are glad afterwards. Honor thy father and mother is a commandment that has promise attached, that your days may be long on the earth. The maid carried away the salad plates, thinking of a letter upstairs full of a mother's pining for a sight of her daughter's face. The girl had meant to have an oceanfront vacation this year and not to go home at all. But Mrs. Pepper's tender words of seeing her mother again in Beulah land had softened the girl's heart and set her mind to thinking. When the ice cream was served and Mrs. Pepper had taken a piece of cake, she laid down her fork with a sober look. It makes me think of Mrs. Horn. I had clean forgotten her. Here I sit eating all the good things and she with the same old corned beef and bread pudding. Do you think your cook would mind if I didn't eat my cake and took it to Mrs. Horn? She shall have some and cold duck too. So you needn't worry about hurting the cook's feelings. You're so generous. We don't get rich cake in the home, and Mrs. Horn has a real sweet tooth. She don't get so much pleasure out of life as I do, for she takes things hard. She frets. The matron does speak out pretty sharp sometimes, but of course she gets tired having 40 old ladies to look after. That's the worst of it. We're all old. If there only would be some children among us. She ate her ice cream in silence. It was the first moment of silence Mrs. Ashton had enjoyed all day. Mrs. Pepper took her cup and looked up with an apologetic little laugh. It always makes me quiet when I think about children. I love them so. I never had but one of my own. She joined mother in Beulah Land when she was seven, but I think about her just as if she were here. Sometimes she's grown up and sometimes she's a baby. Mrs. Ashton drew a sharp breath. Her greatest sorrow was that she too had lost her only child and she never spoke of her. But little Mrs. Pepper would surely understand. She took a photograph from the locket around her neck. This is my baby. 
She lived to be five. Oh, the darling. Houses are so empty without children. There ought to be young feet in every home and young voices. It's not fair. My brother has eight children and no money to bring them up on, and I lose my one and only. I used to feel that way, but now I'm glad other folks can have them even if I can't. When I see a pretty little girl, I make believe she's mine. There's so many children needing mothers and so many mothers needing children, but they wouldn't let me have one at the home even if I could afford to have it. Best I can do is keep some peppermints always in my pocket and give one to every child I can. It's in a woman's heart to love children and do all she can for them, isn't it? Yes, it is. May I ask a personal question of you, Mrs. Ashton? Why, yes, of course. Do, do you know the Lord Jesus is your savior? Why, yes. I asked the Lord to save me when I was 17. Well, then you know the greatest blessing of all. We'll see our girls again, won't we? Yes, I suppose we will. They are just as alive as Jesus. What a beautiful thought. I imagine our two little girls could be talking to each other, just like you sitting across the table from me. Yes, we will see our girls again when we journey to, to Beulah Land. It's the only thing that could ever comfort a mother's heart.
Would you care to see the house? Oh, yes, I'd love to. Mrs. Pepper's happy tongue pattered as fast as her happy feet, upstairs and down. My, what a place for young folks. They came back downstairs as the clock struck four. Mrs. Ashton rang for the maid to bring Mrs. Pepper's things and went herself to ring for the car. Thank you, my dear. I'd like to give you one of my Easter tulips. Tulips are the flowers my mother loves best. Ma'am, what you said before about not ever regretting the times you made your mother happy, I've been thinking about that. A sudden warm surge of love and longing for her mother ran through her heart. I have a vacation next month, and I've made up my mind. You know, it's been too long since I've seen my mother. Oh, you won't regret it, dear. Say, could you put some water in this little vase and then set this flower in front of the baby's picture? I know it's not much, but maybe it'll be a blessing to Mrs. Ashton. Do you like poetry, Miss Pepper? I love poetry. Do you know these lines from Browning's? I've been thinking about them all day. The years at the spring and the days at the morn. Mornings at seven, the hillsides do pearled. The lark's on the wing, the snail's on the thorn. God's in his heaven, all's right with the world. Isn't that beautiful? I didn't get all of it, but those last two lines I can remember. God's in his heaven, all's right with the world. I feel just like that always. I believe you do. I see Edwards has the car, so you must be going. And here's Mrs. Horn's box. Someday you must come again and bring her with you. I never can thank you for all you've done for me. I always say, a cup of cold water given in his name shall not lose its reward. You have surely done what the pastor spoke about today. You've shown me the power of the risen Christ shining in you. With misty eyes, Mrs. Ashton turned back into the library. On the desk shone the tulip near the baby's picture. Suddenly, the mother dropped into her chair and with her head in her arms, allowed the tears that start life springing again in a cold heart. Dear Martin, I need someone young in this big house. Can't you spare me your oldest daughter? I know she is longing to study music. Please let me provide for her education. If she will be homesick alone, Send your son, who wants to be a landscape architect. I'll take good care of them both. And I need them. If they need me, I'll be glad to have them, Margaret.
Mrs. Pepper snuggled into her corner of the grand automobile and smiled at the chauffeur, but his young face was reckless and hard. I'm obliged to you for taking me home. I hope it isn't using up too much of your time. I'd like you to have one of my flowers. Hasn't it been a lovely Easter? I'm glad you think so. He spoke gruffly, but he took the tulip Mrs. Pepper offered. Somehow, it made him think of Susie's bright, laughing face. The sting Mrs. Ashton had planted earlier in the day had settled into a sour disposition, and in that mood, he had quarreled with Susie Murphy, his fiance. Now their engagement was broken and torn into tatters was the vision of starting a newlywed home in Mrs. Ashton's guest house. He would resign his position and go west and forget all about Susie. It was all ended. Don't you love tulips? I shouldn't wonder, but there's some girl thinks you're just about right. You'll be good to her too, you're that kind. Are you not married? No, nor ever likely to be now. <laughs> oh, you young folks, you've been quarreling with her, have you? Well, lover's quarrels don't count except as excuses for making up. She's crying her eyes out now likely why you look as glum as an owl. I always say, who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies? You go find her and tell her it's Easter. Jesus is alive and it's the time for new beginnings. You tell her there's only life and love in your world and you're sorry you forgot it. She'll have her arms around your neck before you can say the word. Women are like that. <laughs> Edwards looked from the yellow flower to the little lady with the blue eyes. Something hard and heavy in him suddenly turned over and sent bubbling up again all the hope and love and loyalty that were underneath. Yes, women are like that, aren't they? <laughs> he straightened at his wheel and laughed. It was easy now to explain the delay of the morning because of the flat tire, and in telling his story, the last bit of soreness melted away. Thank you so much. It has been such a lovely Easter. And may you have plenty more. Mrs. Pepper pattered up the steps and through the door of the home. The matron stood in the hall. Mrs. Pepper passed her, smiling, and then turned and went back. I had a bunch of Easter tulips this morning, but there's only this one left. I'd like you to have it. We appreciate all you do for us. I always say, I have learned that in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. The matron's thin lips relaxed, and her eyes looked a little less tired. I'd almost forgot it was Easter. She had meant to have prunes for dessert, but as she sniffed the blossom, she decided it might be a good night for ice cream with raspberry sauce. Mrs. Pepper cautiously opened her door. She was not sure of Mrs. Horn's mood after being left alone for so long. Well, you did make a day of it. In such a day, everyone was so good to me. What do you think I've got for you? Some roast duck and lemon chiffon cake. Why, I declare, where'd you get all that stuff? Well, it was no rich relation. Mrs. Ashton sent them to you. She was so good to me. Everyone was. It makes me feel bad to think I'm so useless in such a lovely world. Mrs. Ashton put $100 in the offering plate. What do you think of that? I sat right beside her and saw her do it. Well, where are all your flowers? I thought you was going to bring them home to look at all week. I can look at yours. One's just as good as a whole lot. Mmm, good cake. Long time since I tasted any like this. I've been thinking about you today, Miss Pepper. 
I suppose you won't get a new star in your crown just for cheering up an old woman like me, but at least you did as much as that. I've been safe since I was a little girl, but lately I've been more of a criticizer than a Christian. I'd like, I'd like you to forgive me. Will you do that? Oh, I already have, Mrs. Horn. I've been reminded today, while I looked at that flower, that Easter, Easter does mean something. There is a God who loves flower, who brings the flowers to life each year, and maybe he, maybe he can revive this sour old saint of his. He cared enough that he sent his son to die in our place and to bring us alive by his resurrection. And on top of all that, he gave me one good friend to remind me of him. This flower reminded me of all that. Flowers are such a blessing. They're like a resurrection themselves, all that beauty coming out of a little black seed. And I'm glad you remembered what Easter's all about, Mrs. Horn. It warms you up so. Mrs. Ashton told me some poetry today that was just like Easter. I think I can remember part of it. It said, God's in his heaven, all's right with the world. Well, I'm not much for poetry, but that sounds right pretty. <laughs> and when God's in your heart, all's right with your world. Well, I'll have to agree with you there, Miss Pepper. Oh, Mrs. Horn, what a beautiful Easter it's been. He is risen. He, he is risen indeed.
close your eyes for just a few moments. With the time we have remaining, with your heads bowed and eyes closed, um, I'd like to speak for just a few minutes, and if you would just listen. If you are a Christian, you know what it means to be saved, then as you reflect on today, many of you were here this morning, you were here tonight, as you reflect on today, you know that this church has tried to focus together on our risen Savior. And you know the miracle of the resurrection should propel every Christian into evangelism. The idea given to us in Matthew 28, where the angel of the Lord speaks to those women, and he says, come and see, and they do. They come and see that empty tomb. But then he says to them, now go and tell. With your heads bowed and eyes closed, I know so many of you are Christians. Would you do that? Would you, as we have saw the empty tomb today, this morning and tonight, as we've thought about our risen Savior, would you faithfully, in the days, weeks, and months to come, go and tell people of our risen Savior? So think about that, dear Christian. But then maybe you're here and you're, you're not sure you're saved. One of the songs the choir sang, I think, is entitled, Here in His Love. And if you're concerned about your spiritual condition, you're concerned about your soul salvation, you're concerned about your sinful situation, here in his love, it says in 1 John 4.10, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his only begotten son into the world to be the propitiation for our sins. Nobody looking around. In that one verse is the gospel. In that one verse, we're reminded that all of us are sinners and yet, and yet, God's wrath set against sinners has been propitiated by his only begotten son, the perfect lamb of God. So you're a sinner and I'm a sinner. The difference between me and maybe some of you is that my sins are covered by the shed blood of Jesus. The story of the gospel is a story of love. Herein is love. If you aren't sure you're saved, today is the day of salvation. I wonder how many of you here do know for sure that you're saved. Would you raise your hand as a testimony of God's grace in your life? Good. Would you put those hands down? Maybe there's some here who couldn't raise their hand. You say, Pastor Johnson, I'm just not sure I'm saved. If that's you, would you lift your hand up just quickly so I could see it and pray for you? Yes, ma'am. God bless you. I see that hand. Anybody else? You're not sure you're saved. Hey, if you just raised your hand a moment ago at the conclusion of this service, um, I'd like you to come and see me um, and, and let somebody, I'll have somebody take the word of God and show you how to be saved. What a, the, the idea of Easter, it's a wonderful miracle. But part of the miracle of Easter is that names are included in the Lamb's Book of Life. And I'm telling you, if you trust Christ today, your name is going to be included in the Lamb's Book of Life. If you just raise your hand, you come and see me at the conclusion of our service. All right, everybody here, I invite you to look at me here if you want to look up. I want to just say a couple public words of appreciation uh, for the production that we just enjoyed, our choir director, and I want to mention a few people, and then we can thank them uh, at the end. Our choir director is Jason Hamilton. Would you stand and wave at the people, Jason? All right. And then our cast director is Bree Gallion. Bree, would you stand, please, and wave? Good. And piano accompaniment, Tiffany, Tiffany, you look like Tiffany, but um, there's Tiffany Melvin, okay, back there, good. And then I think the author of the production is here, Shelly Hamilton, and if you didn't author it, I give you credit anyways, okay? All right, so Shelly is here, how about a round of applause for her, we appreciate her. Good, and a big thank you for the choir and all the cast members, would you give them a round of applause, please, good. Go ahead and stand, everybody, please. I'm going to have Pastor Jonathan come and close our service in prayer. And uh, indeed, church family, I hope you will faithfully do what I endeavored to instruct you to do, what the Bible instructs us to do from Matthew 28. You have come and seen the empty tomb. Now go and tell that Jesus, yes, he died, but he conquered death. And he alone is the one who offers everlasting life. And if you are among those who raised your hand and said, I'm not sure I'm saved, you come and see me. All right, right after this service here. Pastor Johnson. Well, I hope the activities of this Easter day are encouragement for you to 
be back in church on Wednesday and to uh, just continue to serve in all the ways that you do and uh, to take the opportunities that God gives you this week. So to close in prayer, I'd like to have the, the pastor of the evening, uh, Peter Gallion, to, uh, to close us in prayer. By the way, did you notice in the script he preached for an hour? <laughs> All right, let's pray. <clears throat> Dear Lord, we do thank you for the message of Easter and the message of the resurrection, Lord. We thank you that it's the message worth dying for. Lord, we thank you that you did come and die for us and that you did uh, rise again and that you are still risen, Lord. We would pray that anybody here that does not know you that would make a decision tonight to know you, we thank you that you died for me and for my sins, Lord. I would pray that we would go out this week and do as Pastor um, mentioned to to spread the word and to, um, to, to share the good news that you are risen, that you are alive. Um, <clears throat> Lord, just uh, bring us back this week. Help us to have a good week. And uh, thank you for all those that were able to join in your pray. Amen. Amen.